Can you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. A couple of announcements. The one is to announce a public hearing on Monday, January 25th, 2016, at 7 p.m. in Village Hall to consider a discontinuance of a paper street located at the end of Permits Road. Uh, the second announcement is a check over $25,000, which was for Worldwide Industries, which was the final payment for the Riverview Road water tank replacement, which has been signed and probably now mailed out for that. Uh, correspondence. The only correspondence we had was related to our public hearing tonight. Um, I received Seventeen, as of about four fifteen, four thirty today. Um, the majority were uh, against the uh, against the proposal. Um, I don't know. Did they want announcements? Mark, do you have any announcements? Yeah. Just the normal thing about slow down Irvington signs and bumper stickers are available upstairs, and. Uh, <coughs> We've been missing some, have been disappearing off the street, so uh, maybe it's better to come to Village Hall to pick them up directly. <laughs> yeah, I should have started with uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, is there any public comment? Not related to something on the agenda. Hello. I'm Beth Ryan, and I'm a, a commissioner on the theater uh, committee, and I was hoping to bring up the topic idea that possibly with the happening of having the film crew from DreamWorks here in town, that we might try to step forward in some way to generate the idea that DreamWorks be amenable to the idea of having some type of screening or special event at our theater, possibly as a fun fundraiser. Um, we're trying to raise a lot of funds for the theater, and we're doing that very successfully, step by step. And this seems a really ideal opportunity to um, approach them in a very organized way somehow, whether it's just the theater commission or also with our trustees, to say to them, is there a way we can uh, have some type of special showing? And I think it would generate a lot of interest in sellout. So that's what I wanted to share tonight. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we, when we, they first came to us, we kind of uh, asked, but we unfortunately our only contact really was the, um, the, you know, the, the person that was the uh, location. location manager. Um, they said they're going to run up the, the board or run up the, the chain of command and uh, we'll get back to us. So if we have any updates, we'll definitely share it with the theater commission. Fabulous. Thank you. On that same The same idea? idea to have a screening here. Or oh, okay. For so a special that's event. Uh, It'd be fun to have like some kind of premiere or something like that. Yes. What that's, a, what, that's what I was hoping for, but we could have it you know, a month later. Would, a, care, would, a, yeah. would a letter from the theater commission or the film group be I think we'll find helpful? out. What, it, it can't hurt, certainly. Can't hurt. But, you know, I think that, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, I can't imagine that it'd be that hard to organize something, especially because we have a projector and the screens and, you know, it's not like they have to create the wheel or something. So. Okay, good. Good okay. idea. I like so it. We'll go for a letter and then. I go for a we'll, letter we'll to along. send it to Brian and Larry, yeah, we'll, maybe. We'll, we'll get, contact that's not just the location manager exactly that's what we're hoping for any other public comment not related to uh something on the agenda if not we'll move along to the uh consent agenda do you have any questions on the consent agenda from the board i think it was interesting the standard mileage reimbursement went down this year because the gas went down mm -hmm. if there's no questions we'll uh make a motion to approve the consent agenda can i have a second all in favor Aye. Aye. <coughs> Next item is continuation of a public hearing on the draft environmental impact statement for Brightview Senior Living Irvington for property located 88 to 94 North Broadway. Uh, did you want to, for people that are just tuning in, do you want to, to catch them up? Yeah, well, and I apologize to people who have been in previous meetings because I'll be repeating myself, but I think there's some people who haven't been um, involved in this um, before. Um, so let me just tell you briefly what the petition's about and where we are in the process. Um, as you know, Brightview Senior Living submitted a petition 
um, requesting the Board of Trustees to amend the zoning code to construct a 150-unit assisted living facility um, at uh, 8894 North Broadway, where the big white building is. Um, this, the facility they're proposing would have 85 independent living units and uh, 65 assisted living units. They would remove the white building that's there now, replace it with a, a much larger building, and um, they would retain the three stone buildings on the site. Uh, the project would include 10 affordable units, six of them would be in the stone buildings, and four would be independent living units in the facility. <clears throat> you should understand that once a petition is filed by a property owner, the board doesn't really have any discretion to ignore it. They have to consider the petition, and that's, that's why um, um, you're here tonight. Um, while, while merely accepting the petition um, isn't discretionary, the board's deciding whether to um, approve it or not, approve what they're asking for or not, is totally within the board's discretion because this will be a legislative determination. Um, the, the zoning change would permit assisted living facilities um, on certain sites in the 140 zoning district. And then the amendment they propose also has very specific um, what we call bulk requirements, amount of coverage, setbacks, type. Like, uh, um, if the zoning amendment is adopted, which is a giant if, but if it is, um, as proposed, by right view or with changes, the Board of Trustees would have to grant a special permit, the Planning Board would have to undertake site plan review, and the ARB would have to um, approve the building. Um, but we're very, very early in the process now. And the, the initial step in considering any zoning petition is to undertake review under the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act secret. Um, and under the, the secret statute, the environmental review has to be not only on the amendment, but also on the building itself. So that's why the board is considering the building itself. It's not assuming they're going to pass the amendment, but they have to treat it all as, as one action. Um, in, in January 2015, about a year ago, the board declared its intent to be, intent to be lead agency for the secret review. None of the other agencies that had to make a decision objected, so the board's the lead agency. The first thing the board did was to go through the environmental assessment form that the applicant submitted um, to identify what the potential environmental impacts of this uh, facility would be. And once the board found that there was a potential of even one significant um, negative impact, they had to uh, issue what's called a positive declaration and require an environmental impact statement. Um, a draft um, uh, environmental impact statement, is what's referred to as the DEIS, was prepared um, by the applicant. It was reviewed uh, at first blush by the village's planning consultants and by me um, to make sure that it addressed um, everything that was in the scope, and I'll get back to the scope in just a minute, and um, whether it was ready for um, um, public review. The, the board determined that it was complete um, and held the call for public hearing in December, which it continued tonight. The board did not approve anything in the EIS. It does, isn't saying anything in there is right or wrong. It's just that, okay, you, you gave us all the information we asked for. Should back up a little bit and say early on um, last spring, the board held a couple of scoping sessions um, to identify what the possible environmental impacts might be, and had a long list of um, items for the applicant to address in the DEIS. So all the board looked at when they determined that it was complete was yeah all the questions we asked they answered. They have not decided whether they agree with the answer um, or not. Um, the purpose of the hearing tonight is to hear questions and comments from the public on, on the draft environmental impact statement. Um, 
These comments and questions will then be um, responded to in a final environmental impact statement. Do you see the court reporter in the front? She's taking down all your comments. They will be responded to in a um, final environmental impact statement. Um, also, any written comments that have been submitted will be responded to in the final environmental impact statement along with comments by the consultants. We have hired a fire consultant, but I should have introduced Susan Jane Show here from um, AKRF, who are our planning consultants and engineering our engineers uh, look at it. Um, tonight, the applicant won't be responding to your comments or your questions. The Board of Trustees won't be responding to your comments. The point of tonight's meeting is to make the comments, get them recorded, and then they'll be responded to in the um, final environmental impact statement. The only, maybe occasionally I might say, oh, this is already addressed in the DEIS. This question has been addressed in the DEIS, just so it won't, because I don't expect everybody to read, you know, all the whole thing. But um, um, that way it won't be, the FEIS won't be repetitive of what's already in the um, DEIS. After the board closes the public hearing, whether it's tonight or whether it's after a subsequent hearing, there'll be a 10-day comment period. So, so after it's closed, you have 10 more days to submit anything in writing. Anything you in writing you can, can submit submit now. Now, I, I, I read some of the correspondence that came in, and then it was, you know, don't approve the project. The board's not voting on it. There's a long, long way off. All the board is doing now is um, reviewing the draft environmental inspection. After the whole CEQA review, it isn't until that whole process is over that the board will be deciding whether to adopt the zoning or not. They're not adopting the zoning tonight. They're not approving a DEIS. All they're doing are hearing your comments, which will then subsequently be um, responded to. Oh, and just one other thing I want to correct, because I, I, I'm mentioning it because several people had, um, had referred to it in letters that this property is zoned for multifamily. It's not zoned for multifamily. It's a, a misunderstanding, but just so you understand it. But to emphasize, this is very early in the process yet. We're still working on the environmental questions, and, um, you know, very good. And I'll just, I'll just add, you know, I'll just reiterate two things that Mary has said. Again, this isn't a forum for question and answers. You ask us questions about, you know, how tall the building is, and we, and we, we answer it. Even for the applicant, that's not the purpose of this. This is, this is a listening board tonight. We're here to hear your questions, your comments, make sure that the applicant can respond to them, make sure that we are, we're aware of your concerns, so we can consider them before we, we vote on the DEIS. Um, and I, the only other thing I'll say is that this is really in the process. You know, I, even though we, we voted on the scope back in April 20th of 2015, so it seems like a long time ago, this is really, this is the second public hearing now on a document that, you know, obviously takes a while to review. It's very large. Um, it's, it's online if you wanted to look at the entire document. There are copies, I believe, at Village Hall and in the library. So if you wanted to see all the uh, handouts and things, uh, I like to have a paper copy myself, but if you're happy to read through it, it's on. The, it has been on the web since we received a copy. Uh, I believe it was in uh, <coughs> end of November, sometime. Yeah. Uh, November, actually, early November, November 6, 2015. I think it was the next day. It was put up on the on the website. Um, I would also urge any of you who are not signed up for our email blasts, sign up for our email blast. Just go to irvingtonny.gov, click to sign up because. Uh, we like to try to figure out the best way to let you know about things. For us, the most effective way is an email, because A, you've signed up for it saying you want to hear about it, and that's the way we distribute most of our information. We also, uh, you know, would obviously announce public hearings, but I know not all of you come to our meetings. Um, but, you know, we want you to be as involved in this process as we can, as we can possibly have you. Um, you know, uh, we can't control if the enterprise does a cover story on it or not. Um, we're happy to do have a public story on every uh, everything that comes before our board, but that's just frankly not going to happen. Um, so we want you to be involved from the beginning. Luckily, this is still very early, early in the process, so if you're here tonight, you are involved since the beginning pretty much. 
And with that, uh, except if any of my fellow board members would like to uh, say anything in the beginning, we're here really to listen to what you have to say. The only other thing is up in Village Hall in the lobby is a model um, that's still up there uh, that represents the current um, plan, a physical model. Um, also, um, I was asked that the people that come up to the uh, microphone please spell their name. Perfect. Um, I will. I will actually just read a quick list of, uh, of correspondence we received in the last few days to make sure that you have your uh, your um, your letters. Uh, if we received it after about 4:30 today, it might not be on this list. But uh, Christine Plazas, uh, Jeff Ritter, Alan Weis Weisman, Christine. Uh, I'm sorry, Catherine Sun and Jacob Skyberski, Linda Jenkins, Eric and Eli Hallowell, Jamie and Stephen Wilson, Katerina and Umberto Medina, Stacy McLaughlin, Barry and Patricia Grover. Uh, Monica Levy, uh, Neil Marr, Scott Ovidashian, Chris Wolf, uh, Edward Gahan, Claire Cornish, Ron Cohen, and Amy Martini. So I just want to let you know that we did receive your uh, your letters and they will be included in the DDS. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those letters are going to be on or just wait for the DDS. <laughs> I was just wondering if those letters were going to be online as part of uh, documentation for tonight's meeting. I thought it makes sense, not just wait until the DEIS. Yeah, we, can, we, can, we can put them on, on the uh, website. I mean, so I don't post the things. Yeah, there's no reason not to post them. They're public documents. That's what I'm, I'm trying to get at, yeah. so that people can actually read them. And then we can also you can make sure that your letter was received in this in that uh, in that spot on the website. <laughs> but with that, with uh, not else anything to say, uh, without further ado, who would like to be the first speaker tonight? <laughs> Come on, someone's got that. There we go. <laughs> Good old Ann. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ann Atchison, A-C-H-E-S-O-N. I live in uh, 18 South Dutcher. And um, it's kind of a death with a thousand cuts to try to read that DEIS because <laughs> it's got a lot of um, stuff in it, some of which I think is uh, probably not accurate. But I've heard Marianne say many times that the importance of this document is it's your document. And so the words in it have to, you have to agree with it. No, and no, let me just clarify. The DEIS is not the board's document. The FEIS okay. is the board's so document. The thing that is coming, emanating yes. from yes. this, that we are commenting to today, is going to be your document. Mm -hmm. And so you have to agree with the words that it says. And so I think sometimes, especially when it's a gigantic thing like this, and a lot of it is incomprehensible to the average person. Just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. So I think it's important to especially pay attention to the executive summary, which is the first section. And one thing I noticed was that they, there's a list of several bullet points which summarize the proposed mitigation measures. So there's a little bit of talk about the project and then without saying what is supposed to be mitigated, but one assumes it's the adverse impact on the environment, the village, traffic, blah, 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 blah. Their, their bullet points are put forward to say what is being done to mitigate any kind of in negative impact. So the first one is that to maintain the character and appearance by keeping one driveway, one single driveway in the existing curb cut. That's not a mitigation of any potential impact because any other use of the property would still use the existing curb cut. There's no other possibility because of grading and so forth. So it's kind of a um, false mitigation of nothing to say you're going to use the same curb cut. The second point is to provide the large landscape front yard setbacks, um, which will preserve open space and preserve the character of the view shed. Again, the idea of a large landscape front yard setback sounds nice, but the notion that their plan would preserve open space is disingenuous. They're in fact vastly decreasing open space on the site. To say that they are maintaining previously undeveloped portions of the site is also double steep. The area they're not developing is resource protected by virtue of its slope. So I would not 
be in favor of having those two bullet points remain worded the way they are. The third one is about the architectural design, and they give precedence for the colonial style that they're building it in. And um, the precedents don't make any sense. They cite the town hall. Okay, fine, we all know what that looks like. 76 North Broadway to Fargo Lane. None of the, neither of those are visible from any street that they're on. So no person can decide that it's a hallmark of the village. And 164 Washington Avenue is in Dobbsbury. I don't know what the picture is in the application of that. The, of Washington Avenue, but it's not 164, so that that's just wrong. And then the secondary point to be made is that historic preservation architects like Earl Ferguson and many others that we know and love in Irvington have often said, as we've discussed historic um, buildings, that new buildings should not be made to look old, but they rather should be built of their period fitting into the context. So there's only one thing worse than, than a new building trying to look old or historic, and that's an institutional building trying to look like a historic mansion. And I, I just think the whole thing fails miserably in terms of touting the architectural qualities as preserving the character of the village. Then they talk about maintaining the pedestrian easement. Um, so. They say before that that the pedestrian easement has no, isn't used and is overgrown, so preserving that is like w big whoop. And um, then they say they're going to install landscape buffers and so forth. Um, if you wouldn't have to do that, if you would have just preserved the open space. And then the final thing, which to the last bullet point, they say that their their plan contributes to the villages and the county's goal of strengthening existing centers and corridors of development by providing a viable residential <coughs> use as a replacement to an underutilized office use. So I would say that it, while assisted living is a really good thing to have and maybe it is Westchester County's goal to strengthen the existing corridors of development by adding housing, I think it's debatable if you could term North Broadway an existing corridor of development. As far as the village of Irvington's goals are concerned, I think that it would be a polar opposite of a development corridor. Preservation of open space, resource protection, and preservation of village character. So um, I think that last bullet point really is not accurate because the, this plan really doesn't fit in with what I think a lot of us perceive as um, village priorities. So um, the other few things that I thought were why I was able to read through the details enough to actually make a comment had to do with trees, obviously. Um, I think I will say that it was very refreshing that at least all the numbers of, you know, how many 50, 50 trucks a day for two months dragging stuff out of the site, all of those numbers were at least in the document as opposed to other ones we've looked at where you had to do the math yourself and then argue about it. But, you know, obviously there's going to be a huge amount of cut. There's going to be, you know, um, enough cut taken from the site to cover three and a half acres with one foot of material, so um, shame they didn't do that before the school had to do their field. Um, and, but, and then the trees, they're going to remove 75 trees. They say they're all in good condition, everything within the limits of disturbance, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But then the stormwater management is the place where I found that there was the most holes um, because the plan, first of all, is described in Appendix H, which is not available on the website. So I might be wrong about what is in there because I didn't, wasn't able to look at it, but I did read the summary of it. And I think that the plan they have, which is to put all the stormwater into Coltex or the equivalent for eventual infiltration, doesn't really meet the new DEC requirements for runoff reduction volumes, which is requires green infrastructure to treat the water quality volume with soils and plants. So since we're in Westchester County, we're in a phosphorus-impaired watershed. 
So the water quality volume is equal to the one year storm, one year rainstorm. And the usual thing to do is to create a train of green infrastructure treatments that act in concert with each other to reduce runoff. Um, the way that the runoff is discussed in the part of the document that I was able to read is outmoded. Um, now you're required to actually calculate water quality volume and tell how each one of your practices reduces runoff volume. Um, and since this particular application seems to be relying completely on infiltration into the subsoil from Cultex, um, I think you need to be aware that the water quality volume can't be assessed or how much would, how much would be infiltrated can't be assessed as proposed here until infiltration tests are done and the DEC prescribes how those are done and in what kind of a grid and um, they have to be done with a pipe so that what, nothing can infiltrate in the sides of the hole because Coltex have no sides, they only have a bottom and it has to be, the number for infiltration has to be given two feet below the design body. So all of those things are not, are unknowns and so they can't possibly tell you that they're mitigating the stormwater infiltration using calculations that don't, aren't based on real numbers. Also, you should be aware that disturbed soils that are not restored count as impermeable surface in water quality volume calculations. So if if they're not if they're disturbing soil that they're not going to remediate, they can't they have to count that as impermeable. And the last thing has to do with the limits of um, disturbance. There's a figure in there, and I photocopied it, a piece of it, but you'll see it's somewhere in there. It describes the limits of disturbance. And it's in the context of that they want to preserve an allay of trees that goes on the right branch of the existing driveway, which they did as a concession to discussions that were with the board, where I think it was Mark who suggested, couldn't we save those trees? So what they've done is they've made a little decreased limit of disturbance around those trees and they've made a little one around some other trees and around that little stone house and then they've left their um, so they have a few little undisturbed areas that are islands and um, one of them it goes over the existing driveway on the right so I am per per personally not convinced that these little islands of um, quote unquote not limits of disturbance are really going to serve their function of protecting trees because they're on two sides of where they're going to do all of their stormwater infiltration, which we know means digging gigantic holes and filling them with gigantic pipes and gravel. And um, after all, protecting trees, as we know, means protecting their root zones from compaction. And I'm not convinced that um, they can protect the root zones of these trees, given the way they've drawn their little maps from heavy equipment. And also, when they have these little corridors, it's not clear to me exactly how they're going to do this. Are they going to make a new, are they going to reinforce one arm of the driveway? Are they going to make a new road? If they have these um, areas of quote unquote undisturbed soil, are they going to make construction roads through it? Do they need to drive a truck through it? And again, it all goes back to the fact that if you draw, if you, um, you know, call it outside of the limits of disturbance, but you're still going to drive a truck on it or dig a, dig a hole in it or whatever, then it really doesn't count. So I don't think their tree protection plan is adequate at all. Who's next? You're out here in the spot. I'm in the spot, yes. Um, my name is Josh Freeman, F R E E N A N, 75 North Broadway. Um, first, thank you for everything you do. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to comment on this project. I have uh, looked at the DEIS. I can't say I understand everything in it, but uh, some of the points brought up by the previous speaker are things that I noticed as well. Um, very briefly, totally in favor of assisted living in Irvington. Totally in favor of a healthy tax base for the town and the schools. 
would love to see innovative types of group and multifamily and affordable housing in our town. So I want to just get that right out there. No opposition to any of those things. I am opposed, however, to chains. I use the chain um, in our town. Uh, I'm opposed to deviating from the comprehensive plan, which a lot many volunteer hours went into putting together. If it's time to review the comprehensive plan and come up with a new comprehensive plan, that might be a laudable thing to do if you can get the volunteers to work on it again. Um, I'm also very much opposed to um, kind of ad hoc uh, changes to zoning, um, sort of one-offs. Um, I don't think that, I think that's sort of a death of a thousand cuts for a town like this town. Um, and that's pretty much everything I have to say. You know, I mean, not opposed to the concept of assisted living or anything like that. Do it within the existing plan. Don't ask for changes to zoning. Thank you. I think the only problem, the only big problem with that is that assisted living isn't allowed by our, so you okay. have to change the zoning for that at least. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, who's next? Next. Chris. It's nice everyone's sitting on the edge so far. So. Yeah, sit on the floor up here. <laughs> floor space. Uh, hi, I'm Kristen Wall, 58 West Clinton Avenue. That's W-O-L-L. -L. Um, I was up there since the inception of the plan. So I've been through this whole process, and I've been staying on top of it since then. And so <coughs> when my question why I was there and agreeing with my fellow board members when we were asked conceptually, are you in favor of an assisted living, independent living, memory care, uh, housing in your community? And we all said yes, because we are. Um, and that's where the zoning text comes in that we we're just talking about. That's why I, I stood up now. It's because that's the zoning text amendment change, that we'd have to change the zoning code to say yes to assisted living. However, that amendment triggers a special permit which exempts the applicants and the proposal from our resource protection part of our code, Article 15 which is a very important part of our comprehensive plan. It's resource protection, it's about the environment. And yes, that's what this whole process is right here now. So what happens is we have we accept the, the concept of, um, I'm just gonna call it senior living. And then the next step is to do, as Marianne had said, the environmental impact and see what that is. And, and, and this whole environmental impact process, it's a New York State law and it's a decision making, I really need to face people. Um, it's a decision-making tool for the municipality to enable board members to wrap their minds around this project. They do everything from budgets to dog parks. So um, it's an important tool. Now, I don't know how far it, the whole process needs to go, but for me, when I went from yes to, uh, to senior living, to no, not this project, it was when the project was first proposed. The 165,000 square foot project, the three acres, impervious acres, three impervious acres. It is gigantic. And at first I was just shocked. I was, how, how did this come back? I mean, some of us would kind of fantasize about what the senior living facility would look like. It would be some architecturally pleasing boutique kind of you know, structure on the top of the grassy knoll. That's what we were envisioning. You know, something maybe similar to the size of the building there now, 33 square hundred feet or maybe 50 square hundred feet. I'm sorry, 50,000 square feet. But this proposal was absolutely shocking and it didn't hit me at the time. Why is this so good? And then I realized it's a chain. I mean, Braveview is a chain and it's a big box chain and they build big box complexes just like a Walmart and actually I looked at Walmarts and this is the same size as the Walmart White Plains that's 179,000 square feet I don't know how much further we have to go with this project I don't know how much more time needs to be spent by a board that has a lot of other things to do when this clearly is the impact is devastating just the 19,000 gallons per day of water used 
and everything Anne said. Now, I realize at this point we either have to break down every, you have to, <laughs> break down every single element of the DEIS, I guess, or is it possible just to say without further um, investigation that this is just too big? It's disproportionate in our town. So I'm hoping that the trustees will at this point say, this is just not doable. It is a chain. Maybe we should check our code. Perhaps we're not allowed to have a chain. But I don't think this is mitigatable. I don't think it's mitigatable to have a chain. And I don't think it's mitigatable to have a project that's the size of Montana and expect it to get mitigated down to Rhode Island. So I've gone over my time. Thank you. Thank you. Who's that? This is somebody tall. <laughs> Power, you're well positioned. Okay. Uh, Barry Graubart, G R A U B A R T. Love the Sycamore Lane. Yeah, uh, so, I wanted to share a few comments. Uh, you, you know, first, I guess a simple reminder something very simple, right? The, the applicant is asking us to change the zoning laws of the village. Zoning laws are there to protect the welfare of the community as a whole, right? Not there to help one seller or one buyer maximize their ROI. Um, so we, get, we really need to keep that in mind. You know, I, I think in this instance, we have a seller who wanted to get above market value return for their property. Can't argue, we all love that, right? Um, and we have a buyer who cannot make their economic model work if they stay within, forget the use change, but stay within the other zoning confines of the size for bulk, for, uh, you know, for, for overall height, for bulk, for size uh, of what, what our laws permit. So both of them are just looking to you know, exceed, to, to leverage you know, their economic return and want us to change our laws to permit it. Um, those of you who know where I am at 11 Sycamore, I'm right on the corner of Broadway, and we got a nice muni lot there. It would make a really kick-ass spot for a Starbucks. You can put a drive through, right? But the village won't let me sell my, I, and I bet Starbucks might be willing to pay me more than a family might for my house. It's a great spot. You can park in the muni lot. You can do a drive through. My wife would probably rent a room and live there. For Starbucks. But you can't do that, right? And, and we'll say, oh, it's changed or whatever. We put in zoning laws because that would not be fair to the rest. I know you guys are thinking, Starbucks sounds good right now. But it wouldn't be fair. So we don't do that. And that's why we have our zoning laws, right? In this case, you know, and, and the applicant weaves this interesting tale. They, they're coming to Irving because they love the community. They love the character of the community. We've heard that song before, right? It, it's just, then they put up, you know, as Chris described it, it's a McNursing home, right? I know it's not a nursing home, it's ALF, but this is a big box, massive thing. I hope everybody's driven over to 119 and stop and shop and looked across the street and said, oh my God, look at that monstrosity. Oh wait, this is gonna be 50% larger than that one. That was only three stories, 90 units. We can do better than that. We'll do 150 units, right? This is, this is nonsense. It makes no sense. You know, and, and, and let's talk about what is not being built here, right? We only have a handful of really large uh, spots in the community that might be coming up for sale in the coming years, right? This one is walking distance to the train. It's really in a good location. And we do have a need. We have an obligation. We have a, you know, I feel we have a moral obligation as a community, but you can also look legally to the Westchester settlement. We do have an obligation to put in affordable housing. You know, a few people, Josh and others, have referenced the, uh, you know, the comprehensive plan, which talked about the need for, you know, afford, for not for affordable housing and those sorts. It wasn't talked about in the same way in 2003, but have looked for, you know, empty nester housing and multifamily housing. Um, this spot would be an appropriate spot for multifamily. And if you did that, by the way, you could get real affordable housing in there and not just a few token exclusionary units where it's like the people, it's like putting a scarlet A on everybody who lives here for affordable. That they're, they're, that's not, you know, there's a whole thing for affordable housing that it's supposed to be inclusionary zoning where everybody's equal. You don't know which unit is the affordable one. Everybody's the same. We can bring vibrancy back to the community. We can have spots for young couples to move in. We can have spots for empty nesters uh, who want to sell their house when their kids leave. 
and, and meet some of our commitment to affordable. So, you know, I think we should just reject this application outright. You know, there's no reason to change the zoning laws of our village on the behalf of a specific applicant. So, thank you. Thank you. So we'll be able to start us in the new uh, uh, Mercy College. Right, right over the border. It's literally on the border. It's going to be in the new dorm. So, it's all for the public. So. I just going to enroll. We can walk out of the to it. Uh, who else? <laughs> who else? Someone really hard, like in a corner. That's the one to be here. We could pass you the microphone. How about if we pass you the microphone? That's like an auctioneer. You can say your name quickly. There we go. Yeah, if you might. You might just pass you the microphone. You might just the microphone. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm Stephen Wilson. I live with my wife Jamie at 28 Sycamore Lane. Uh, I feel like it's deja vu. It's like a Groundhog Day. Um, two years ago, we went through an 18-month process with a proposal from a company called Continuum. And all the things we're discussing right now are the pre... The, it's like the beginning of what has to be approved, what has to be changed to make something happen that is too big and is wrong for Irvington. And at the end of the route that we went last time, everyone agreed what was being proposed was too big for the community. And I was stunned when I first heard about somebody else wanting to come into Irvington to put up something that was bigger than that proposal, that had everyone up in arms and rejecting it. And here we are again, revisiting exactly the same thing. Where does this lead? You start the, the process for the approval, it gets approved. Now, we already know we have issues with IVAC, and I, I detail many of my concerns, which were the same concerns I learned a lot about having to go through this two years ago. The same concerns we had then will be the same ramifications for the community today, and I just want it on record, uh, while I'm like many of the other people who've already said, I'm for the idea of assisted living, but a boutique assisted living facility is right for this community not something the size of a Walmart. I sell Walmart. I know what Walmart deals with on a daily basis. I don't think we want that kind of huge institution suddenly arriving in our town. So that's my two cents. Hey. Two pence. Who else? Standing. Who else? Pass the mic around. It's very fluid now. Yeah. <laughs> um, Patty Graubart, 11 Sycamore Lane, home of future Starbucks. Um, I, I know I, I've been a broken record, but again, um, wanted to just mention IVAC. I think everyone probably in this room received the uh, letter from IVAC calling for donations. And um, from the continuum experience, there's been further deterioration in functionality where we, we were advised as a community that they are now engaging um, per diem paid staff because of the shortage of uh, resources. So I, I guess for me, we've kind of put the cart before the horse in that I think the village really needs to tackle that issue before we start looking at um, even building a boutique assisted living facility as we see growth at the fee property, um, as we see this other facility in Terrytown, other assisted living facilities being built even outside of Irvington that are draining emergency resources along with um, the village. So I think we really have to be very careful about how we're approaching this because I think, you know, the health and safety, never mind e economics, but the health and safety of the village residents should be our primary concern. The other thing is, you know, to, to change our zoning um, would have to be an extraordinary circumstance, something unique and something that benefits the village. And, you know, as my husband noted, this benefits Bridgeview, this benefits the seller of the property, but I'm not sure that we've heard anything about how this benefits the village. Um, and we certainly have heard a lot about how this <coughs> takes away. It's not a special project. I'm not sure if, if someone else mentioned that they have petitions in West Harrison and in Pleasantville as well. So we're not sure, you know, where else they want to build a Bridgeview facility um, using almost the same photograph of the facility. 
in these other locations that those petitions are pending as well. So I think we really need to think about what we're trying to achieve here. And before we waste any more resources, we should decline this out of hand. I'm Ellen Weissman. I live at 19 Meadowbrook Road. And um, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said. And particularly, I'm concerned about zoning changes uh, that are precipitated by um, specific projects that don't really keep in mind the overall comprehensive plan for the village and the real priorities of the village. But living on Meadowbrook Road, what I, I want to talk about is traffic. Um, Meadowbrook Road comes out at the top uh, where Broadway is and very close to where this facility would be. In the morning, trying to get out of my neighborhood, either off of Meadowbrook Road or Fargo Lane, and turning onto Broadway is dangerous and difficult. Um, I think this will only aggravate that situation. I have to say I'm somewhat um, skeptical of the numbers that have been thrown around in terms of it not affecting traffic. I think there are things that haven't been discussed. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with assisted living facilities. My parents live in one in the Chicago area. In addition to the staff and the residents, there are a lot of ancillary care people who come and go physical therapists, occupational therapists, privately hired caregivers. Um, many of them are, you know, the caregivers are often on shifts that are similar to uh, other traffic times, but there's a lot of coming and going in these, in these places, not to mention, you know, visitors and, and you know, all kinds, of, all kinds of people are coming and going constantly. So I think that the traffic issue on Broadway has two components. One is the difficulty making turns onto Broadway. Uh, I think we are seeing a lot of backups in the afternoon heading up toward 287 that are extending back even beyond uh, Sunnyside. And the other thing is that we've had concerns in the village about pedestrian safety and kids getting hit by cars. And I think adding congestion on Broadway is a really bad idea. And I think adding um, drivers who may not be familiar with the area, octogenarian drivers in the independent living facilities who may have slower reflexes and less you know, acute vision, I think we have to be realistic that this is not a benign situation on, in terms of traffic. So I'm just going to limit my focus to that since everybody else has hit on some of the others. Thank you. The side of the rooms are underrepresented tonight. There we go. <laughs> oh. I like an old school traditional coming out to the <laughs> Pat Ryan, 10 South Dutcher Street. And let me just say I am not speaking on behalf of the Arlington Historical Society. This is not an issue that we have dealt with. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, the white building, that stately building on Broadway, is a 1970s office building. Uh, it is not a historic building. There are three historic buildings on that property. And my understanding is that we have a commitment that those buildings <coughs> will be preserved. So it is not really our issue at this point. Um, as a resident, however, I do feel that uh, there are many issues that have been brought up here tonight that are reasonable, that people should be concerned about, and be involved in this process going forward. But I don't feel that this is a process that should be stopped. This is a property that is going to be developed. None of us are going to stop that. We have a choice to make. And our choice is to work with developers to determine what is the best deal that we can get for the village. Now, I understand that change is always difficult. And the idea of a facility of this size is, I'm going to say, unacceptable. It is too big. It's too overwhelming. Traffic issues are there. Um, 
only Anne could detail <laughs> the environmental issues. I mean, those are real, and I think we all need to deal with them. But I don't think it means that you just say, no, out of hand. I hate to say this, but old people have to live too. And would there be issues with this? Yes, there would. Does that say, well, not in our town? I think we all have a responsibility here. I mean, you can't say, so what, old people should live in Elmsford or Mount Vernon or New Rochelle, but not in Irvington? That's, that's pretty unacceptable. Facilities like this need to exist. Should they be smaller, appropriate, manageable? Yes. And that's the job, I hate to say it, of you. And that's your job to come to some sort of working agreement and working plan that allows something like this to exist in our village. But to say that it doesn't belong here, that it creates too many problems, you know, the, the reality is that we all have a responsibility here. And our responsibility is to say, these people have every right to live in a community as lovely as this is. Can it be done in a way that does not make drastic change in our community? I believe it can. I believe that the developers are going to have to make huge changes and huge sacrifices. And I'm sorry to say that. but. It is the only way that it will work here. But I believe if, if you can come to the table with a plan that is acceptable and manageable, then this village would be open and welcoming, but only under those conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Something else? <coughs> Hi, Jan Blair, and I've lived in the village for about 32 years and sat on both committees uh, to review the comprehensive plan. And I think um, the main thing that we addressed, and I've known all the old timers and all the newcomers, um, mainly when we reviewed the, the comprehensive plan, we had a vision for the village. It's our village, and we, we, have, we should have a, village, a vision for our own village. How do we want the village to look in 20 years? 30 years, and it's what we do that will preserve the future of the village. I think, you know, you can mitigate, you can go through all the environmental review processes that you want to go through, but the bottom line is, it's our village, and we need to review uh, all the applications that come in and scrutinize them, and I, I think that, um, Pat, like Pat said, we're not going to stop development, but I think that's the purpose of a comprehensive plan, is to really look at how you want your village to look. I think part of the responsibility of the uh, Board of Trustees is to initiate perhaps another comprehensive plan review committee to look at the village, to look at it again. Um, things are moving very quickly in the village. There's more demand for development in the village. Uh, property values are extremely high, so everybody wants to sell a little piece of their property to make a high profit. So, and not to say that we shouldn't have assisted living or senior citizen living, but we need to have that vision for our village. And we need to keep that in mind because this is, as Chris said, this is enormous. And I don't know that everybody in this room realizes how enormous it is. And it is a very big project. A lot of impervious surface, a lot of runoff. That will be contained, but it's just, Huge. Uh, so that's all I can say. Hi, Kimberly Raby. Um, I live at 20 Strawberry Lane with my husband James and my daughter Tennyson. Um, we've only lived in the village for about 15 months. Um, I think some of you heard the story last time, and we we first learned of this project about a month after we closed. Um, Obviously, we share a property line and would be very directly impacted. Um, so I'll, I'll state that. I think everyone would be aware of that. 
Um, and I'm not a specialist in aging or assisted living, um, but I do understand the need for the services. And I, I think everyone in this room does. I don't think anyone could shake their head and say not of value, of high value, of course. Um, but I did take some time to do a little bit of research and kind of understand what the situation was in Westchester County today. Um, and I took a look at the New York um, State Department of Health web data sets. And currently, um, within a 20 mile radius of 10533, there's, there's 21 centers, assisted living centers, with 2,500 beds. This does not include nursing homes. And I don't know if that's a lot or not. I, I really don't. Um, but I also do know that there's several, several other um, developments proposed. Um, we heard tonight from you know, West Harrison, Pleasantville, and I, I don't know how many others in the area. I just think we need to be aware and ask those, those questions. I didn't see any information in the DEIS you know, of the, the current stat in Westchester County. I saw some information on aging in general. We might want to ask that question. Um, but I guess most disheartening what I found when I did a little bit of research is there's actually two assisted living centers um, in the area, one in White Plains and one in Brooklyn, that evicted their residents. Um, I mean, we have to remember businesses are in business to create and also to sell. Um, so the Esplanade and Prospect Park residents in Brooklyn, in both instances, they were sold to a developer um, and converted into apartment buildings. So uh, again, people are in business to make money. If this isn't profitable, it will be sold for something else. Um, and I, I know we have to, you know, ensure our, our board will understand that and you know, you know, have those conversations as well. Uh, but it's not just in New York. Last year in Washington D.C., uh, two residences were closed. One in San Francisco. Um, and I'm just asking the board to think about the really long-term implications of this rezoning and construction of such a, a large complex because the assisted living center may go away, but that building will still be here. Um, and I also, there's, you know, there's 15,000 nursing homes across the country. And there's definitely a trend, you know, that we know that the aging population is growing. Um, but also, technology is becoming smarter. So I hope that you know by the time that I'm ready to leave, you know, possibly will never need to leave my home, that there will be enough smart technology that I can stay there till the end. Um, and I, I guess there's a trend too. I asked my parents. I've asked other people's parents. People want to stay in their homes. Um, I think that as, as Medicare becomes more available, there'll be more money to enable people to stay there longer. Um, and I guess I just want to think about, again, beyond five years or 10 years, but what happens 20 years from now? So that's all. David Rubin, I'm at 55 Circle Drive. I'm categorically against this, but I just want to ask a question. I'm going to ask this question, which is this. If, for some reason, the board were to come to the conclusion that they should approve this application, will that have any, any effect down the road for their ability to, to approve or to be vulnerable to having litigation against them in other cases that can come down once a precedent is set? I have no idea, but I think that question should be it. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Marr. I grew up in Irvington and moved back about a year ago. I live at one uh, shady lane uh, with my family, my uh, wife, and, and two sons now. Um, I came before you a year ago uh, with a petition from residents of Irvington regarding the historic district here. Um, the petition was in favor not only of the historic district, but also in favor of laws that would be enacted locally to empower the town to protect buildings from demolition within the historic district. Um, that petition was a, a successful um, one. It uh, garnered uh, over 500 uh, signatures. Um, uh, it, I think, helped uh, promote the idea of a historic district and the laws to protect buildings within it. And ultimately, this, the town of Irvington, I think, did the right thing and, and saved buildings like 116 Main Street. 
I, I'm back tonight uh, because uh, the residents of Irvington have started another petition on this issue of the Bright View development. Um, the petition was begun less than one week ago, about four days ago. Um, as of about five o'clock today, we had over 240 supporters. Uh, this is an incredibly quick uh, rise. These are both individuals, but also households. And that number continues to rise even after the meeting tonight. What, what this petition does is it not only has people sign the petition, but it also allows them to write comments on why they're signing the petition. And I wanted to read a couple of these right now, just so you can all get a feel of what's going on here on the ground, on the street, in people's homes, and how they're thinking about what you um, So uh, just read a couple of them now. And again, this is not me speaking. It's the, the petition signers. One signer said, well, I think a well-planned assisted living center could be a positive addition. The developers appear to require a size that is inconsistent with the scale of activity in Irvington. Why can't the developers use the existing historic building and pare down their plans? Another sign. Broadway is already a congested, scary speedway. An influx of more traffic from a development like this will exacerbate the situation. Another signer. The first land use committee, composed of an impressive and talented group of citizens, thoroughly explored zoning issues throughout the village in the late 80s. Their report was unanimously accepted and enacted. Excuse me. Do you have something to add? You should say their names. Say their names. Who's saying this? The petition. I can. I'm giving the names to the board. Okay. And the comments are with those names. Okay. okay? So if you let me finish, no, then you can come up and speak all you want. Okay. Just saying. I'll, I'll the do petition. That. Say their names. Please, please just address the board. We'll get their names, Thank not you. the public. Okay. <laughs> I'll I'll start again on that one. The first land use committee, composed of an impressive and talented group of citizens, thoroughly explored zoning issues throughout the village in the late 80s. Their report was unanimously accepted and enacted in 89 by the then Board of Trustees, of which I was a member. That's the person commenting. The village has only grown since then, and I see no reason to add to the density and traffic of the northern end, as attractive as the concept of a local assisted living center might be. <coughs> Just three more. I want to preserve the character of the stretch of Broadway that runs through Irvington. Broadway is the gateway to our village. <coughs> another one, another commenter. Perhaps most concerning, there is still no way to mitigate the adverse impact on the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps. Our understanding is that IVAC is at the breaking point, already engaging per diem paid staff. Why is the Board of Trustees trustees even considering this massive expansion of an already overwhelming responsibility. And finally, we have recently witnessed the tragically insensitive overdevelopment of Dobbs Ferry along the Sawmill River Parkway, forever devastating one of the most beautiful parkways in our region. Once a region is rezoned, there is little, there is little one can do to stop development. We simply cannot allow our village whose charm and beauty is so much about the sensitive scale of our buildings to be forever ruined by development that will bring larger commercial buildings, decrease the density of mature foliage, and increase traffic congestion. Remember, this is not about one building. A zoning amendment sets a precedent. What I want to emphasize here is that the people who signed these, this petition are not against an assisted living facility in Irvington. They are also not against affordable housing in Irvington. Many of them went out of their way in their comments to praise Irvington's attempt at, at, at affordable housing and to encourage the board to continue on that, that, that project trajectory. And they're not even against thoughtful development here in Irvington. Rather, if you read the comments, what they are against are its size, Page. Its size, that it will greatly increase traffic congestion, that it will overburden the volunteer ambulance corps, that it will weaken our democratically created zoning laws, and that it will pave the way for even more development in the future, and finally harm the historic character of Broadway and the village as a whole. I'm including the petition and handing it to the board. 
along with the names of the signers and their comments. And the petition basically asks that the board not amend the zoning laws for this project. Thank you. Who's next? Seats are opening up. Can we go for a second time? <laughs> I just want to quantify some tax revenue questions. Um, I think we have one, one new speaker. Before. Chris, then you can go again. Thanks, Brian. Sure. And if everyone has spelled their name, except if Chris has already spelled their name, you don't have to. How's that? <laughs> I only spelled the wall, so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Kaufman, uh, 28 North Ecker Street, and uh, K-A-U-F-M-A-N, and K-A-G-H-Y. So I, I actually just wanted to reiterate what most everyone here has said. I, um, I emphatically agree with Pat that we should have um, housing that accommodates seniors. I look forward to having that in the village. I look forward to living here um, until I can't walk up my front stairs anymore, and I, you know, and I'm very hopeful that we'll have um, accommodating housing here for people with a variety of needs. I do, I, I would like to see that housing um, be integrated as opposed to age segregated if there's, you know, any way to attract such housing in our village. I think that, you know, we understand that walkability is critical and we know that um, the rest of our population that lives west, um, east of Broadway tends to drive into town and I don't think this population would be any different. So I do think it would exacerbate you know, having a senior housing or any housing of that scale on the east side of Broadway would exacerbate um, traffic. I, I'm skeptical of the um, traffic generation figures that were provided in the DEIS. They don't, I, I'm not an expert on traffic generation, but I looked at them and they actually seem to imply that each individual um, living in, and, I, and I'm sorry, I was trying to, to find them while I was sitting here and, and couldn't access them, but I, I think they, the implication is that each individual who lives in the residence would actually leave like, you know, less than twice a week um, by, by vehicle, unless I'm misunderstanding. Um, they, they seem very unrealistically low, and I, and I do see that they used a traffic generation calculator that's <coughs> provided by a national organization, but there are five different calculators available on that organization's website, and I'm not 100% sure. I, I think they might be um, disproportionately conservative figures, so without, without knowing a lot about that. Um, anyway, so I, I just wanted to, to say that I, I actually am 100% against this project. I agree with Pat that I would love to see this kind of housing. Um, I don't think on this scale, I, I think this would be at the cost of quality of life for everyone in the village, and including the residents of this of this development. And um, unfortunately, those are impacts that are irreversible. So sadly, I don't think this is this is the right project um, to address those needs in the village. Thanks. I just want to speak again so I can do my knees. Hi, Eric Grahn, 81 North Broadway. I'm just very concerned about the height of this building. It's going to be um, 48 feet high. So it's going to be looking like a wall because the property is going literally from one side of the property to the other. So you have 15 feet, I think they've got, or maybe 30 feet um, on the sides of the property. And then it's going to be 48 feet high. It's going to look huge because from Broadway, um, it's already um, going to be elevated by about 20 feet. So we're going to be looking at a structure that's 68 feet approximately uh, tall. So it's something we should all be very concerned about. The other thing I was really concerned about from the last meeting was the blasting that's going to go on during construction. Um, <clears throat> there's solid rock down there, so all the neighbors are going to be affected by that. Their structures of their homes will be impacted. I mean, there could be litigation issues for residents if their homes are damaged during this blasting. 
I mean, something to seriously consider. And I, frankly, am quite worried about it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone want this? Chris does. <laughs> Else before I have a second time. Um, so, uh, Kristen Wall, 58 West Clinton Avenue. Um, well, I did have a question actually. Um, so, when they talk about um, items in the DIS that people have questions about, like Kathy's question about the traffic, how is that addressed? What happens? In the final environmental impact statement, they'll be a response. So they'll say in the FEIS, there'll be response. Any questions raised tonight will appear in a document. The FEIS, the questions will be there in an answer. So could you give me an example of a response? Like, let's say, for example, there is more traffic than we see in the DIS. What would the response be? I don't know. I mean, we're not yeah, getting traffic, answers today. That's the point of the FEIS. Their methodology. Okay. So I guess I think what I was just trying to figure out is. Does the board go through the DIS point by point like Anne did to not accept it here? But do you specifically say, well, that doesn't seem right, or the could you? Is the board is coming up with its own memo, with its own questions, and that a memo on the DEIS, and those questions also will have to be. And then we asked. also had our experts, our expert firm that we hired to look at it, as well as our attorney. We have several consultants yeah. already. Right? The have engineers will be looking at it. And we have specialized it. consultants for certain it. issues, like, like hired, traffic issues. Uh, <laughs> OK. We hired a fire. A fire expert, yeah, yeah. fire matic expert. Um, Yes, yeah, for each, each thing that we didn't have expert staff for, we would hire an expert to look at and come up with their own questions that they gave back to get answered. Okay, so at this point, the DIS, did, did um, ACAF already look at that? We're in the process of looking at it along with the Okay, so the DIS we have now, you, you may say, oh, we want to look further into the traffic and the water. This is the only DEIS you're going to get. This is the document, right. DEIS. This won't be changed. Any questions will be addressed in the FEIS. The DEIS isn't going to be revised. It exists as a, and then the next document will be the FEIS. There'll probably be a couple of drafts of that. The FEIS consists of the questions and the responses. So when you get to the FEIS, what if people say, oh, I still don't think that's the right traffic calculation to use. What happens then? At some point, we have to cut the, the, the board's going to have to decide that this was finalized. And, and to me, you know, yes, you can probably ask questions about it forever, but I think if our traffic expert, for, to use your traffic example, if our traffic expert has said we like, their traffic expert gave us something, our traffic expert looks at it, then our attorney looks at it, our planning board, if we have questions we can ask, we can all look at it again. If we still think it isn't, I mean, if one person in the audience doesn't think it's the right methodology, Maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but, you know, how do we know anything's right if we have all of our experts look at it and say we think this is right? Yeah, yeah. at some point you have to cut it off. Yeah. I just, I saw that people were Chris, the, the other DIS. thing is that the people FEIS, <laughs> what Ann referred to earlier, the FEIS is the board's document. So the board will decide, you know, so, so maybe... Um, the applicant will continue to say this is the right um, this, this is the right multiplier, um, but our traffic expert will say this is a better multiplier, and the board will you know the board most likely would go with the with its own consultants, but it'll be the board's decision what goes in the FEIS. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you for answering that because uh, that's really hard information to get online. Um, and then I just wanted to just say one more thing because um, a previous speaker did mention the, um, the, the village getting, getting a deal. And I do just want to mention because we've talked about property tax revenue, and originally I kind of thought that was uh, a good use too um, to get more revenue. But I ran some numbers if you have like a uh, six, five bedroom houses that sell for about $1.7 million. And the truth is, all said and done, it's only about $100,000 more for the village revenue just for Irvington per year. And for, um, for the school tax, it's only about $260,000 more. And so the school budget is $57.6 million. And this would only get $250,000 more per year. 
Um, so the whole concept of everything there's students, but we get all this extra revenue. It's not that much revenue um, in the long run. And for the village, first of all, the school has a very, very healthy budget. We all know that. Um, they're establishing um, even a capital fund for 1.5 million. And um, the village we operated a $400,000 surplus last year, so and our fund balance is very, very healthy as well. So we don't need to, um, you know, just to sell out for the revenue. And then affordable housing is a big concern, um, and I'm glad it is. But um, if six houses were sold there, one would have to be affordable. But the way our law works, that could actually be three units, because one affordable housing at 3,600 square, square feet is too big. So they can break that up into three units. So we're not giving up that much affordable housing by you know, selling, selling out to such a large structure. Um, so, and then recently, um, we made a development that's going to yield six affordable housing also. So um, I just wanted to get those facts out there. And again, I'm over my time, so I'm by. Thank you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. If no one else wants to speak, I just want to add one, one quick point or comment. <clears throat> just a clarification. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Barry Gralbar, G R A U B A R T. So, so a clarification, you know, when we talk about elder housing, I think that's important to all of us. We've, you know, I used to have hair. Um, but there's a difference between assisted living and what is considered sort of empty nester housing. We've talked in the last round of this around senior apartments and other things, not, you know, five to $8,000 a month warehousing of seniors, which is a, it's, you know, it's a short-term thing. My mother lived there until she suffered the acute condition of having her bank account run dry, and she's bounced out. I mean, that's the business model. But I do want to, my point was really, I, I, I appreciate when people are saying, look, if they can do this in a smaller way that fits the character of the village, that doesn't, isn't such a burden, we'd like that. We did that dance multiple times the last time through. And, and what happened was that, you know, they spent, we heard, I don't know, $2 million, half of that on lawyers, half on architects, designers, God bless you guys, it's a good business. But what they kept coming back with was they could not make it smaller because it didn't fit the economic model. So go look around at the other Brightview facilities. They don't have 45 unit facilities. It, the, the model doesn't work. So the idea of saying, you know, we have to accept this and let's just negotiate them down, I don't buy that. I think. We really need to go and look at it, and I'm, I, I will say, you know, let's find multifamily with affordable housing. That location would be perfect for a mix of senior apartments and affordable housing and doing it in a way that really helps the community without taking on a burden that we can't handle. So thank you. Sorry, David Rubin again. Oh, you yeah, yeah. Classical driving. Barry is pointing to excellent. But my question, and I have another question, I don't know if you can answer or not, is if the Board of Trustees were to determine that they don't like the proposal, what recourse, if any, does the applicant have at that point? I, again, I don't think you can answer that here, but someone's got to know. Maybe you can tell us now. I don't know if that's appropriate at this time. Anyone else? Yep. First time. <laughs> Hi, guys. Dennis Flood uh, for Meadowbrook Road. Uh, just a little clarification on the uh, comprehensive plan uh, that was spoken about uh, in an extract uh, type manner. As a city mayor at the time, I can tell you that uh, I believe um, assisted living is an allowable site uh, or allowable uh, location on Broadway, but certainly something of this magnitude was never envisioned in the uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, secondly is, I think what we all have to be aware of that there's three options involved here. Three options. One is to do nothing. Two is to build the six or seven allowable homes on that property, which is eight acres, I believe, or third is to do something like this. You know, from my perspective, and believe me, I sat here for a long time, 13 years as the mayor, three years as the trustee, we did everything, our board did everything we could to keep the character of this, of this community intact. I would like to see that continue, and I think it's very, very important because once you build it, it's built, and that is it, and you change your character forever. I'll, 
I'll say something else to uh, Ann Atchison, A C H E S O N, just to um, kind of get back to the site and think a little bit about what isn't said, has, some people haven't said explicitly, but you have to realize if you think about that site, it slopes uphill. And part of it is steep slopes, and there is a 15% or greater slopes. There is a map in the DEIS that shows it, and some of them are in the front. Most of them are in the back. The whole back part of it, the eastern part of it, is a woodland. It's too steep and too rocky to really develop. The pro current proposal, which it includes removing 75 trees and then removing up to 25 feet of bedrock from that same place where the trees are currently growing at the back of the property so that they can sink the fourth story beneath. And um, also the other thing that I think n you need to be aware of in talking about whether you're mitigating the risk or the, the negatives or not is that they also stipulate in, this, in the um, language of the zoning amendment that the equipment that's going to be on the roof doesn't count towards the height of the building. And so, and the, uh, the zoning amendment also stipulates that, that whatever the first floor is where you start measuring, not the actual first floor, which will be partly underground and partly above ground, so, or at grade, or whatever it is. So um, really, when you, cut, when you boil it down to, um, mitigating environmental factors, you have to look at the site. And whether or not six or seven houses could be built there or whatever somebody thinks, um, there's still resource protection. And if you went through the regular subdivision or house building process on that property, you would have to follow the resource protection rules. And trees are protected, and soil is protected, and walls are protected, and slopes are protected. And so all of that stuff limits where you can build something. And so when you look at the site, yes, you could build something there. There's already a fairly huge building there and some parking lots on the flattened parts of it. But really, when you co it comes to the rest of the site that's, that's not occupied already by driveway, parking lot, or building, um, it's, it's um, you know, pretty much unbuildable it, according to Irvington's resource protection law. And when they show the old subdivision um, application from last year, and it, there were a lot of problems with that application. And it's in your DEIS, but you should also have in your DEIS what the planning board comments were before that application ended up going dormant. Because among them was the driveway is too steep to um, conform to current code. And so these are all things that need to be looked at is look at the site and how, how do you mitigate taking a site that just is not amenable to this. It's like continuum where they were going to dig down 10 feet so that they could build their building. And there's no reason to do that. Mr. Rubin asked a question earlier. My name is Lou Maggiata. I'm a lawyer helping the Kim and James Raby. Um, Marianne said at the beginning, some of you may not have heard this, that this decision being a legislative decision is totally discretionary. So I think that answers Mr. Rubin's question. <laughs> Someone wants to know what that means. <laughs> Short of some very unusual circumstances that it really can't be challenged successfully in court uh, because it's a decision of a legislature or whether or not to grant the zoning petition. But really, you should hear from Marianne. She, she made the point earlier, in the, right at the beginning. And, uh, but uh, that's uh, my take on the law. I'm sorry. One more question. <coughs> Uh, there's just one more thing I'm concerned about, and that is the lighting for this facility. Um, I'm talking about light pollution being so high up on me here, and the lights affecting the immediate neighbors. Um, already there's, there's quite a lot of illumination around there, but if you look up the site right now, there's only one light, it's quite dark, and all the immediate neighbors are going to be directly impacted by, I assume, security lights, cameras, etc. 
going on at the site. I think that should be nice to all set up with the ship in the wire. Do you see that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jerry Carfiello. I represent the ownership of the building. I think so many people have talked about what the seller wanted to do. You'd have an opportunity to say hello to me. <laughs> Two and a half years ago, we came in front of the board, said my family's looking to get rid of the property. We gave the board a number of options, inclusive of keeping it safe. I think we have, excuse me, I kind of ran down here. I think we have 35,000 rentable square feet. Currently approved at somewhere around 200 foot per person. Those are the cars that are not on the street right now. And if I put up the rent for ten dollars a foot, be rent for twenty-four hours a day, three sixty-five. Now that's not what we want to do. What we're looking to do is either sell this property to something that can help the village better. We presented some ideas to the village. Housing was a part of that, as was well the opportunity to do senior living. We looked at the least impact traffic, property, taxes number of conversations personally in public before any buyer was here we asked the village to come out we shared all of it our family went to great expense to present it to the village now the village have an opportunity to talk about it we've owned the property since 1977 i think we kept it pretty nice we continue to keep it nice continue to cut the grass every week continue to plow it continue to support the community we love the community. We're part of this community. Don't live here. We throw our barbecues on our grounds. Um, that said, unfortunately, my parents died. This property will be sold. It's going to go to somebody. Right use plan is a great plan. It's big. I'm not going to debate that. There's plenty of people in this room have talked about it. I hope there's a happy medium. Because I do believe, well, I wish my mother and father were alive and had an opportunity to stay there. Um, 2,500 units, is that what I heard? A number about senior people in the community. 2,500 beds? There's 10 million people in New York. I'd like to think some of them are over 80. Uh, so there's definitely a need. But I think the community, I hope the community would listen to the plan. I hope uh, uh, Brightview uh, still is positive of this. Um, I hope there's a happy media. Not interested in building six more big mansions. That is on the plan. We are currently with the village right now with the subdivision backup opportunity. Don't want to do it. What we want to do is find a happy opportunity with the folks in Brightview. Uh, one that works within the community, one works with the trustees, and one that allows our family, the Irvington family, to continue to move forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. You all have a chance to meet me. Um, I didn't build it. That's my mother and father. I have the uh, unfortunate privilege of uh, watching over this until this is done so my family can move on. Um, that's our problem. But I wish you guys would have came out two years ago. I'm glad you're here now. But this is not a surprise to the community. Maybe its size is this week. And that's what these meetings are for. Thank you. Jerry, who's uh, like anyone else next week? <clears throat> Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yes, no, no, I, it's okay. This, uh, the next public hearing, maybe you should think of a bigger room. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a sense that it's not everybody you're going to see. Yes. Well, then this is the Former mayor, too small of a room. I'd like to say a couple more things. Just want us to grab someone, grab the mic so we can. Let me grab the mic. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Josh Freeman, F R E E M A N. Um, one thing that I meant to mention earlier was um, one of the things that attracted me to Irvington when I moved here, you know, 15 or so years ago. There's a unique quality when you're when you're driving either north or south on Route 9 um, when you're driving through Irvington. That's different than every other village in Westchester, and this would certainly alter that character in an irrevocable fashion. The other question, I, and this is actually a question. How expensive are these, you know, I mean, in other words, so you, you reach a, a certain point in your life, you apply, you hope that there's an opening, you apply, 
hopefully you're accepted. I assume they do like a wallet biopsy and see if you have enough money to, to go there. And then, you know, you go there, it's, I don't know, $5,000. Like you paid your house off, and now you're going to be paying $5,000 a month for the privilege of staying in Irvington in this place until you run out of $5,000 a month if you happen to be very healthy and a little long time. And then you're out on your keister. I think, is that how this is? This works? Yes. Okay. It's five and up. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking a question. Yeah, you want to speak to that? Hi. Um, I'll just speak to just um, an assisted living facility is for seniors. Um, they provide activities of daily living services. There's no medical services in an assisted living facility or in independent rooms where people just live on their own. The fee is typically four to $5,000 a month. Medicare is not available. It has to be cash out of pocket. Um, and typical length of stay is two years. Um, the staff at the assisted living facility is typically um, an, an aide, someone who can assist with um, activities of daily living, dressing, feeding. Um, and uh, the, the staff is, is, is also um, has a, a noted to have a high turnover. The one thing I don't think anyone's talked about here, though, is if people are moving in to an assisted living facility, I think we also have to think about they're residents of our community. They're not just residents of this facility. And I, and I think we've kind of gotten that out of our, our minds a bit. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, so you would want people to feel engaged in the facility, but to have something so massive, and I, I just think that it, that it just is not something that we want. We, I think as a community, would like to have some type of senior living in the community, but this is just so out of character and, and so, Grand, and I think Barry made the best point. Their economic model does not support a facility that's smaller. So I think we just have to understand that and make a decision. Okay. You guys remember saying I made the best point? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never have to again. Ellen Weissman, um, 19 Meadowbrook Road. I did call Brightview in Terrytown just out of curiosity. They don't have independent living apartments in Terrytown, but they do have assisted living. It begins mid 7,000s for one bedroom, and there's an additional $1,500 per month fee for a second person. So for a couple in a one bedroom assisted living, it's $9,000 a month. Ellen, can I follow on that? Um, I'm Kathy Kaufman, again. Um, 28 North Ecker Street. So that includes uh, meals, and um, the average cost of meals at home for a couple age 65 and over in the New York metropolitan area is ranges from 350 to 750 dollars a month. So you can take off maybe 500 dollars a month for food, um, but it still gets you at around maybe 8,500 dollars a month for a a couple over age 65 in terms of housing costs and in, in, in it also would include whatever supportive services. The, the thing that I was um, considering myself is how many uh, residents of Irvington, because many of us do want to age in place and stay in Irvington when we be, um, you know, need those kind, that kind of housing, um, what percentage of Irvington residents might be um, find that within the realm of affordability, given the threshold of 30% of your income spent monthly for housing, which is the what most indices of affordability um, stipulate. And that the median income in Irvington for people 65 and over is $68,000 a year, including all sources of income, not just wages, but social security, <coughs> pension, um, Etc. That doesn't preclude someone from selling their home and having a, a, um, a very large capital gain that would be um, apart from their income. But it does mean that so sixteen so sixty eight thousand dollars a year is the median income of Irvington uh, of total household 
income for Irvington residents 65 and over in any size household. Um, the other thing that I did look at is I broke that income down um, across all the seniors that are reported in the American Community Survey in, um, in Irvington. And it, it's pretty much bimodal. So what you see is that there's a relatively large population that has an, a household income of $200,000 a year and over, but there's an equally large percentage of Irvington senior householders who have a household income of around $50,000 a year. So what you can see is that there are some community members who would be able to take advantage of this and a very large percentage who would not. Um, I don't, there are a total number of Irvington residents who are 65 and over is a, pro, is a little under 1,000. So um, that's the story. So this would expand the population of Irvington by about 5%. If, 100, if all these new apartments were occupied, we'd get about a 5% total increase in our population, between 5 and 10%. Um, you can assume that some of those people would be people who currently live here and some would not, which is you know, neither here nor there. That's a, good, that's a really good point. Thank you. So, Anne Atchison again. Um, I think there's a lot of what you said is in the DEIS, so the number of seniors and stuff like that. But again, I take exception to um, these kind of sort of no offense to you numbers that are, you know, available for for today. Where and we have to think about the future, and, and that I'm sure the demographics of one, how much money people have to spend when they're seniors and two who wants who lives in Irvington and who wants to stay in Irvington is going to be quite different 20 years from now than it is now because as you all know there were it w Irvington had a lot of working class homes which are now a historic district and some of those homes have been in the same family for a couple of generations and maybe the person who lives there who's likely an old woman like me is is you know, the, the third generation to live there owns the house outright and is struggling to pay the taxes. But then when that person goes away or goes to assisted living, the, the house gets bought by a young couple from Brooklyn, gets gut renovated for $500,000 and sells for a million two. So the, we, who, how much money is Brian going to have when he's my age? Who knows? Because, <laughs> you know, it's, there weren't hedge funds when, when I was <laughs> So, I, I mean, <laughs> it's just all kind of ridiculous to, to talk about. It's fine to put in the DS what the demographics are now, but you can't project how much money somebody's going to have 25, 10, 20 years from now or what they want to spend it on. Any other questions for the DEIS? instead of uh, just generic comments. Since I think everyone's gone around almost twice. Anyone who hasn't spoken at all yet who would like to speak? Heather's just leaving, she's I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything specifically about the DEIS, something that's left out or the answer wasn't clear, et cetera. Otherwise, I think we uh, have a gist of, of, uh, of kind of the direction here. Um, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna make a motion to close the public hearing. There's still a, we can extend the uh, beyond 10 days, is that right? Yeah, the, um, the, the written. Uh, written comment period is, is 10 days from now, so let's say you would add a, maybe even an extra day, a week from Friday, okay. um, which would be, what would be a week from Friday? 15. What? 15. 15? Yeah, 15. so I would say that the written comment period should end on January 15th. Just say, some people I know have been addressing the written comments to the board. Actually, the person they're supposed to be addressed to was Larry Shopper. Um, that's on the DEIS, so send them to Larry Shopper. So then they get circulated properly because it gets sent to a board member and it might not get to the um, uh, to the applicant. So send it to Larry and I'll make sure that it gets to the to the applicant so we can look at addressing the FBI. Yeah. We've got until a week from Friday, January 15th. Yeah, so I think that the I think the public's been heard. I think it's pretty clear message. So I will make a motion to close if anyone wants to give me a second. All in favor? Aye. So written comments, keep them coming. Maybe two weeks. Well, not quite, but eleven days.
Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Your coat's on. It's cold out there. The park is like it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> The mics are on. Hi. Thank you for coming. I with what they were doing in terms of the site plans. They were the entryway from Broadway. There were 20 foot high walls to drive it through. Somebody about the planning board. It wasn't us. We sweet grandfathered it in. Whatever the planning board decided. That's no, we don't. We don't. We grandfathered it in. Oh, we, we never did the, uh, the, sub, the, sub, the subdivision. Brian, you got to be careful about saying the subdivision. What your grandfather did? Yes, the application. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then she said to me, said, well, you need to find out if they want separate yeah. houses or seven houses, whatever. I said, I don't know. Yes, it is. Every house, they all said they were in agreement. She told me the board denied it. Yeah. Yeah. Y
Standing committees and officers. Oh, no. Trustee liaison reports? I can't even think. Okay. Perfect. Anybody have anything? No. All right. Brenda? Perfect. Marianne, do you have anything? No. <laughs> Larry? I got a few questions, too. Larry, you have anything? Well, um, there, there are, if you notice, there are two items on the agenda. If you're interested in talking about that, one is the follow up to the signing discussion that you had last month. Um, apparently there was a couple of open issues, and I think Marianne has some notes on that. Yeah. Um, and the other is the discussion about the update to the comprehensive plan, which uh, I had started a circulation of some information by email, and that may be good enough for you at this point, just to get it started. Just to get started, yeah. Okay. And you got feed, you got additional information from my... Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm just you got additional information from Connie and I yes. back on the comprehensive plan, yes. more ideas of areas to focus. Yep. The only thing I, I just I want to just give a shout out to the, the Rec and Parks Department because in relation to the holiday basket program, just because they really came through and they sent baskets to 29 senior citizens and uh, baskets and toys to 34 families in the Indian Village. So thank you to Laura Koopman, Mike DiNardo, and the PTSA for their help with that. Uh, yeah, I think the work session matters. Uh, I think I will have a proper work session. I don't think I don't want to talk about science because we got a quick update, Marianne. Oh no, it wasn't so much an update as there were there was really only one open question I think that we need, that the board wanted to discuss and we wanted to res kind of res see where the board was mm -hmm. on that before we then moved into my drafting changes and meeting with that. I, I, okay. I the email, I think, had more than thing. one question, yeah. didn't it? Well, you know, so I thought, but I, I, there was really, it was, it was the moving signs. Wait a minute, I'm, 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 oh, I'm moving, flashing, how bright. Yeah, um, there was a difference in the board. You were going to discuss it. The flashing, moving LED signs. Oh. Um, whether, whether the board. Oh. Wanted, wanted to allow them. Can I can I say something quick on that? I, I meant to email everybody. Uh, I wasn't able to make the last meeting, I guess. But I, I've actually had a change of heart. Uh, can you <laughs> find on that? Because I was really, I know I was against them last time we discussed it at the work session, but I feel like especially in this type of retail, like challenging retail climate, um, I don't think we should put laws into effect that make it harder for our, our businesses to to do business and generate revenue. So I'm yeah. going to, I'm reversing my opinion. I'm okay with it. Well, so what that would mean then is you would eliminate that, no, you make that, that those would be band size, flash and moving. They still would require ARB approval. You know, can I, can I say one thing though? Yeah. I think we should say more specifically, because I know it's not going to happen right away. Um, I don't think we should get rid of flashing moving signs because I can still imagine someone coming in with a retro sign that's made out of metal and neon that's going waving at you or something, whatever. So then the ARB presumably would say Well, because that's the, not the only sign we're really talking about approving as flashing moving are these LED signs, which is much different than just saying a blanket. Uh, I think it's much different than just saying any kind of sign can be flashing moving. Yeah, in other words, I, I think I understand the distinction. You mean the, the, the well, more all, um, about sophisticated a um, effectively a temporary neon, sign. the temporary flashing, moving um, LED type is that's that's word, not... Word, yeah, it says coffee, it says open, open it says beer, it says... <laughs> I don't know what it says, but those are what the, you know, bagels, whatever it's yeah. like. Those are ones that, that Mark, you're saying you would not what do you, want. Well, they are certainly temporary. They hang down from a chain. They're not yeah. built into anything. Doesn't yeah, they can be moved around. No, Mark, it doesn't matter. It's, it's temporary if it's intended to be only there for a fixed period of time. It's not how it's hung. And replaced by See, something. That, that's, that's, that's why I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding uh, about what's temporary. Okay. Uh, it's okay. not the yeah. way in which it's hung. Right. And the content is temporary because it changes. But, that's, I don't know but that's how about if they move it from <laughs> there over to there, over to that window? They move it around. Then what do you, then what do you got? 
No, it is. It isn't the location. It's the same thing. It's this. It's a structure composed of letters designed for the purpose of attracting the attention of the public to the subject matter thereof. Then it's a sign. Okay. So then it's temporary if it's placed for a limited period of time to advertise or announce a specific event or occurrence. And then there's some examples. Okay. Now what just. What about, because i got to talk about a specific example, right? You know, so we have the dry cleaner on South, on North, well, it's still North Broadway, but no, actually, it's South Broadway, sorry. Uh, right there, you know, um, next to La Familia, which has basically what amounts to paper signage in the window that's being used, you know, to block the view into, you know, it's, it's kind of for an aesthetic reason. It's not just for sales, so it's not temporary. So would that be considered? How would that? How would that be considered? What's on it? I'm sorry. It's not a sign. It's What's on it? It's like covers the whole window. So it, it covers both like windows. Kind of like, like, like a window it's covering. Sort of see-through, yeah. but you can't. It says green. Have letters on yes, it? it says green cleaning. Green, you know, yeah, this and that. It's a sign. Then. Dry cleaning. I would say that's a sign. Right. And it's and not it temporary. And it's and it covers 100 percent of the window, so it's and it covers yeah, too much of it. So it's in violation of our. I would say that it's a violation of another code. Yeah. Right. That's what we were talking about, where we where we chuckled and acknowledged that actually what's behind it we don't want to see anyway. <laughs> exactly, well, but right. there's a great deal of it. It's like right. so the window is actually you well, can think of it as a small piece of sign, but the, the rest of the conceptually the rest of the window has just been soaked out. You know what I mean? Like block. Now also they could soap out the window and put up a sign. I mean, there's other ways to do it. You know what I mean? Maybe they have a sign. Maybe they may. Maybe you have a, 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 a curtain, and then on top of the curtain you have the sign. There's well, other if, ways if to they were it. even to make a blind there, a cut in the stencil, so it said dry clean at the top, and then the rest of the window, which is a separate stencil, white, would, would, the, would that be a sign then? Uh, the I, I don't know. Mark, I, I can't picture it's, it's not for a tracking business, so I'd say it's not. not right? Because the same thing was allowed for the... No, but he's saying it was separate. If you, had, if you had like a one inch uh, oh, uh, space between them, and then so it's a, you could actually. And I think there's ways to do it, Mark, that they could have a sign that met the code. And still block the rest of the, the window. Purposes. There's other ways to, ways to do it. Maybe it's not being done in the right way. I don't know. I can't picture it. So. Well, I, I want to comment about the flashing. Um, and well, because they also blocked the entire window. <laughs> I have as much desire as Christina to improve business in our little Main Street. I want to encourage business. And I just always argue with myself and with anybody else that if the signs are not, um, well, let me start again. If, if, if a particular business creates signs that don't contribute to the overall positive look of the street, business as a whole is diminished. So if we want to increase business, creating an environment for browsing, walking, having a pleasant experience is really important. So is it diminished, is that diminished by what appear to me, and I think a lot of people, a fairly cheapened way of gathering attention with a flashing sign that says coffee, coffee, coffee. I think we may be shooting ourselves in the foot by allowing that. So I think I'd still hold to the idea that those signs don't encourage um, a good business climate on our Main Street. So. I'm more inclined to limit more things than to allow them. But I, I want those businesses to do well. I just don't think that you know that's a great decision for the, the area as a whole. I just think that the, the, my take on it is I think the business has a better sense of if coffee flashing is good for business or not. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> well <laughs> right. argue, I, I, I don't agree. I, I, I think that um, a lot of the the business is if someone sat down and had a discussion with them about the kinds of ways to attract uh, the kinds of customers that come to Irvington or, or driving by, and let's look at all the ways that we can attract business, 
that kind of discussion, I think, would would often, you know, lead to a different um, conclusion. So, so are you saying you don't like the open signs? You don't. Yeah, like I don't like the flashing. Yeah, the I'm ones not that have op- that flashing. The ones seen. that the ones that are too bright. I think there's a yes. I don't like the open ones, and I don't like the ones that are overly bright that kind of diminish the experience on the street where you just want to cover your eyes because they're so bright. So I don't think it helps business to just allow almost anything. I think that hurts a business district. I actually so, think we ought to have the business people come in and talk to us because I I do totally have mixed feelings because I think that there are certain businesses that resort to that because of who they see as their clientele, such as high school kids and middle schoolers who come in for lunchtime or after school. It's very attractive. We're boarding commuters that are just trying to figure out, is this place open or not right now? I need to get a coffee. I need to run. That's different than the type of clientele that might then go further down Main Street, deeper into the historic district, and maybe, you know, maybe there has to be some, I I don't know where this is going, but maybe there has to be some consideration about whether the signs are allowed in the historic district. Are those buildings along Broadway included? They're all included, right? They're not excluded, right? Yeah. So okay, I would, I I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I know it turns the gas station is included. I'm not sure whether it turns the corner. I should know, I should know the answer to South. that. I'm not sure. But even then, I no, don't, I don't know that that's, think that's, no. that's yeah. on, I think it's the The ones on Main Street are definitely. There, right. there are some businesses on Main Street that I know would prefer to have a sign that says open very clear. Yeah. And so. Oh, there. We, we changed the perpendicular so that we could. That was a very big discussion when we discussed so that we could have a, a little sign that sticks out like Mimas, which was never allowed anywhere else, as a way to really be a vehicle for people who are driving by and want to see quickly. Because if you're walking by, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, but yeah, I, but that Mimas doesn't sign doesn't tell you if you're open or not. Mimas no, just but it, it's, is a very kind of historically viable way of, of like putting out a signboard hanging it out. So that's, how much, well that's, you know, you. I'm sure there are many articles in business and economic magazines about what actually attracts people now. If, on, on Broadway, driving by quickly and you might say to yourself, yeah, that kind of brighter sign that says open might really help business. But I, I can hardly argue with myself to say that if you're walking by a middle block in the middle of Main Street that you wouldn't check your phone and say oh, which which places are open or it, it's I don't think it really enhances business in that kind of little um, street where most of the people here are either coming because they know a place and they're coming here for that reason or they live here and they don't need that open sign. It's, it's, it seems counterproductive to me. And at this so point, we, I could just make a comment. Yeah. We're, we're speculating about what businesses do and don't think, and we're speculating about what does and does not draw people into businesses. And yeah. I'm, I'm wondering how much longer we need to, are we getting to a decision here tonight, or are we just, you know, talking about general thoughts? Does mm-hmm. any of this, how is this going to affect the law that you're working on? Well, so the, the, the way the law reads now, um, it's flashy, moving, fluttering, changing, or intermittently illuminated signs are generally not permitted, except that the ARB may permit such a sign if it finds that it otherwise meets the purposes of this article and the general standards in this section. I'd rather so what, leave it like that. Yeah, what's and, the that, problem? And, I, and I added language after, I, I, I did start working on a, a redraft, but I added, this general prohibition shall not apply to video or computer screens or digital displays, based on the discussion last time. You know, If permitted, such signs including video and computer screens and digital displays may not operate between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. Okay, I mean, I, I, it sounds I to me like that covers it. Yeah, I mean, it's Well, that excludes the, the coffee sign or the open sign. It says that the ARB approves it, right? Yeah. Right. If the, yeah, the, the ARB could. Okay, just leave it like that. Yeah, I think it's fine. Because then the ARB can say, you know what? I, I like that flashing coffee sign. That makes sense. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. If the I'm company says, you know what? Once we put it up, we had 25% more people come. Because right. only county checks are fun. <laughs> 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 if you want to get past it, can't you see? 
Why would you check your phone? Well, people who are... If you're planning to come to dinner in Irvington, you're wondering if Mima's open. What do you do? Well, if you see the sign, you're there. You can help. No, you're coming. I guess I'm missing stuff. You're saying if you're going to drive here. If you're going to come here, even if from my street, if I'm going to pick a restaurant, I'm not going to go and walk down and look up and say, I'm going to say, okay, is Mima open on Tuesday night? But if it's 5.30 in the morning and you're driving by Zarelli's and you're not sure yeah. if they're open or not, that's it. There's like a... Yeah. yeah there's, I can, they can kind of make both. That's why, to me, I, I leave it up to the business. If, if everyone thinks that the business looks horrendously ugly. I don't think they're going to stick around very long. That's um, yeah, but it diminishes your neighboring business and another business. By I can I ask you a question. Does does uh, um, when I say digital display, does that include the LED message cross? Is that a digital display? I, I would it's interpret it very generic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that high tech stuff. Okay. It's like it's not like a digital display. Something could crawl to you. Um, you, the you could say a programmable <laughs> digital display if you wanted to. That would make it very narrow it down to well, some, probably I, something I think no, wider. Yeah, you know, is it too much? I don't think. Well, now what happens though if the ARB den denies an application for? Then there, then there um, recourse is to go to the zoning board of appeals. Which okay. will follow the rule of the law strictly. So <laughs> we interpret it to be one way, and they interpret it to be as the, as the way the law is written. It's getting overridden. Yeah, but actually the law says that it's kind of in your, you know, your, dis your discretion. This one gives you discretion. I never stopped them before. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. So I think, it, I think it, okay. we're probably I'll, back where we started from, right? Way. Then the other, right thing, the other thing we were deciding about was the blackboard. What <laughs> Anyone want the concept blackboard is a sign. The blackboard is a sign. Yes, it is a sign. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I, think I like it. I think it's a great thing. I think we should have more of them. I think we, I every think. business should have a blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, it's a variable sign. Some days it has only drawing on it, and other days it has blah blah. But you know, it should count. They can make use if they want to paint a blackboard. It should make use of some some sort of coverage. Um, so if they leave the same message on the blackboard, it's no more. It's no longer temporary. I don't think it's temporary once you yeah. once you paint the blackboard. I think that's the intention. All right, so intention. it's not a temporary sign, but it's a sign. I mean, that would be my reading. It's the intention is you're going to keep using that space. Doesn't he actually fit within the definition because when it's blank, it doesn't contain or is not composed of letters. I don't know. Well, you know can you just make a specific exception for black yeah, I, 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 I also, I also think we can just. Doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> What's in a lot of Yeah, but I, I see the poor ARB getting, you know. They, they, well, they the, need the specific. If we get more than three blackboard applications, hold on to their visit. positions. Then we know it's a blueprint for it. blackboard. Yeah. Uh, Excuse me, Blackboard, what's the ARB going to approve? What, they're writing on it? Of course not. Yeah. No, 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 but just the, so there's no approval. Yeah, I mean, that just, I don't think it's, I don't think the blank well, man is black. And the size of it. Yeah. It's got to count as sign coverage. Yeah, but the ARB doesn't approve the coverage. The coverage is the building department determination. Okay, then that's that. That's that, yeah. Perfect. So wait, it's a, it counts as... Sign coverage. Sign, sign coverage, even if there's nothing on that's it. They, because the intention is to have something on it. And then... That means so it's filling a hole. There's, there, they have, they're over coverage because they can't. We don't know that. No, no, no. No, we're no. not saying that. We're saying, we're just saying generic it's design should count as coverage. That's a sign. That's all. So we want to specifically so write on a blackboard, or we're just going to sign it. Whatever the, you know, we're letting them skate by on this. So they, oh, so they have to peel off all the signage on their window now. Are we talking about a specific business? We're talking generic. We're talking generic, generic blackboards. I see. I, I think the other thing I mean, is I'm going to have to grapple with, but I don't think that I don't think they were open questions. I sort of thought that you did too. But, um, there were more questions open, but when I went and looked at my marked up memo, I don't think there was. So right. when she sends another version, yeah, we'll look at it. Oh, look at it. there's quite it's a few close. things I have to think out though. So if the answer Connie's question, if there is a uh, contradiction between the pharmacy and the and their coverage. Are they grandfathered or not for their blackboard? Are we writing something that this immediately? They came in after the original. Yeah, they were after this law was passed. Yeah. Yeah, but they. They're not specific to a blackboard. Saying that's just a piece of slate or whatever. We're writing the violation. 
Just Happy New Year. I'm just kidding. It's a misdemeanor, too. Blackboards. <laughs> I don't know. I just would feel kind of funny writing a law that says, you know, blackboards. With blackboards. I say we turn a blind eye to the blackboards. Excellent idea. Yeah. Erase it from your yeah, mind. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and then it's not a sign. It's just, <laughs> that's fine. That's it's fine. just a it's just a weird paint job on the that's outside great. the building. And, and they happen right. to put graffiti on it. Yeah, the kind of creativity should be encouraged. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's not worry about the black walls. We're not going to legislate black so comprehensive plan, we're okay with that for now. Yeah, yeah, so what, what, what I'll do, if you have any other thoughts, Perfect. we'll add to the list that we're getting going. And then you can make one document, maybe we'll send it to us. Yes, exactly. It's not going to be personally like that. We'll and you're good, right? The document and, then add it. and then we'll come up with a strategy for dealing with it. You know, if you want to speak. Each one's kind of different. You know, the, each item on that list is, in some cases, as we were talking about it today, you may need a consultant for something to address something. In some other cases, it's really not. It's more of your brainstorming. So there may be a few different ways to approach some of those items. Thanks for sticking around, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> Signs of part of the ARB. I don't know what's going on. That's right. That's right. Thank you very much. Any, uh, <laughs> any public okay. comment? So Last chance. No, I'll, I'll put it in the... Uh, 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 online for the EIS comments. I, I'm lost. Just help me with one thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let this go. What did we say about flashing? Uh, We're going to leave it this LED language. Signs? They're generally okay. No, right. not LED. They're generally flashing signs. They're generally discouraged. Right. The planning board, the IRB can allow them, but it doesn't include computer. That that prohibition does not. Apply apply to video, video or computer screens or digital displays. But they're still considered signs. Yeah, yeah, they're signs. They're still coverage, effectively. Yes, they are signs. Yeah. Yes. It's just the prohibition is not. Can, can I, can I, can I like, The realtor that has the... I, I just want to see... Just so I understand, the realtor that has that the stuff that's in the window, right? That's the squares of illuminated, illuminated back, backlit pictures or something. Backlit so photographs. Yeah. That's what they are close up. Yeah. Now those things are not. Those things, the photographs can be changed periodically. So what are those considered? Did we come to a conclusion on that? I forgot where I we. I don't know if that. we talked about that. And did we come to a conclusion on what constitutes what too bright? I don't know that we discussed, I don't remember discussing that issue. Well, we did discuss it. I don't think it came to a conclusion, though. And it, it, remember, there was, a, there was a conclave you guys had that I wasn't at, so it might have come up then. And I don't remember I don't know the that discussion that's... about it, but, well, but the... do the real estate... What are the pictures in the window? The pictures I mean, of the houses that are for sale that obviously are going to change once the house is sold. Right. I mean, if we're talking about trying to encourage businesses, I don't know how you're going to say real estate offices cannot put pictures of houses for sale in their window. Well, we used to, in fact, in the, in the code previously, and maybe still, there was actually a specific provision that allowed real estate offices. Wow, yes. Right. Okay. Remember that? Yeah, yeah let, let me allow them to <laughs> share the, the coverage. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if the that's The one question that came up from that walk around was, in fact, those, may not have. those things are built into the, yeah, I remember this discussion, those things are built into the window frame. There's special uh, channels for power that go, and then they're actually, uh, you know, it's like a, a carpentry job, and an electron, uh, electric job to get them in place. So they're not, they're not like they're taped up there. It's not like they're moving. They're certainly not temporary in the no nation of uh, the, the physicality of the, of the holders are not temporary. No, the, the Larry had no, it's just about the open house and for sale signs in residential districts. Yeah, yeah. That was that was what was in there before. Yeah. I don't think there was an exception on a, on, a, on a real estate building. Or if there was, we would have specifically oh. discussed oh. it. Designs. Give me a minute. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that. Um, so tell me where you are about the. Um, about the, the. Is there an issue with coverage on the, the pictures? Well, I think. Well, no, the question came up. What are they? There are, according to Ed, they're being argued that they're temporary. But when you go and look at them, they're obviously built into the window frame. They've, they've had carpentry and, elect, and electrician's work, to, and so 
It's only in the largest stretch of the word that you can call it. Should, should we just ban anything you plug in from temporary signs? Well, I, I don't know, but so in this case... The definition of temporary is pretty good, so... Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's specific. wait a minute. Yeah. Um, they, for a specific event, right, or something? Place for a limited period of time to an advertiser or announce a specific event or occurrence. If I were the real estate agent, yeah, you'd argue I might only say for 60 this days. is just for the, the sale of this specific thing. Well, it might then, maybe it does make sense to have more generically than just the blackboard is, you know, anything designed, you know what I mean? It does anything designed to hold. Like to be a carrier of content. Even if the content changes. Yeah. So instead of the material structure device containing or composed of letters, material structure device um, designed to contain or be composed of letters. Well, those things aren't letters. They're pictures. They're pictures. No, picture, pictures. The real yeah, it says in letters, pictures, or symbols, yeah. it says. So there's something in that language. I, I would just issue. be afraid whether that could capture something else, you know, whether that might be. The real estate agent said that they're um, temporary signs and they're really bright and reflective. Um, they reflect across the street and then pop back. So, so is there a structure that holds these pictures? Yes. yes, there, yes. Imagine yes. this as a frame. Yes. As a frame that then is also yes. pegged into the window at the frame itself and with both mechanically but also with electrical uh, you know, service into the into the backlight panels. So they're definitely installed in a permanent fashion. And plugged into electricity. So can I, can I just make my point once more about the brightness? This seems to be a brightness issue as well as the one that I talked about before as a brightness issue. And I don't think we ever established how to judge if something is too bright. But I'm gonna, I haven't had to look at that. <clears throat> okay, so that is what some other code has dealt with. Right, and that's the one I'm concerned about Does right now. Does this work? The <coughs> definition of sign. Any material structure or device designed or used to contain or be or designed or used to contain letters, pictures, or symbols, and designed to use for the purpose of attracting or that does attract, then that would include a structure that holds those things. It would also include the famous chalkboard. Um, well, if you feel like it does, then good. But can you think about it for a while to see? No, 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 no. I just added that language. Yeah. What did you add exactly? Designed. Designed or used to contain letters, so that it's not only that it contains others, it's designed to contain letters. Oh. That covers the blackboard. Okay, but it doesn't cover the um, the LED pictures. What LED pictures? pictures? No. The yeah, but somebody said. would come in with this structure. They would have to come in to get the whole thing approved. That makes it a sign. And then in the course of approving that, you would have to... The backlit. I, I don't know what we're talking about. It's a sign. The, the whole thing is a sign. It needs approval. And then it also would have to meet the, the brightness or whatever other requirements. So their argument, since it's a temporary sign, it doesn't count as coverage. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be a temporary. It wouldn't be a temporary sign by that definition because those that structure would be intended to be holding or presenting material. Well, no, wait a minute. It doesn't really that, get you around it. That, that's not right. No, any any sign right. that's placed for a limited period of time to advertise, but you're saying that the the thing holding it is the sign, right. not just the particular. They're permanent. Picture. That's not limited. Yeah. Right. And then there are, that definition has specific examples. Examples of temporary signs include signs, handbills, or posters relating to civic or athletic events, concerts, special events, or products or services offered for sale at a reduced price or on special terms. I mean, so in that case, the example really gives you a good idea. A house with someone special. The real estate's on sale. <laughs> yeah, I know. Special. 2.8. Well, so so it seems to me it's three price bedrooms. reduction. It seems to me that you could make a. You know the point. The uh, the first one is regardless of how frequently the content changes, it doesn't matter. Once you have a structure designed to show something, yeah, it doesn't matter the frequency any longer. See, that's the thing that we're getting caught up on. You know what I'm saying? Like the fact that you. Use it. You change it every thirty days. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't make it temporary. Right, and that's all we have to be clear about. That. Okay. 
temporary is really there's no structure involved with it. Right, but you know that's their argument. I know that we just said that. We're, we're, yeah. That's the point, how that we're changing the law to fix it to close. So now that they, you know, the law gets changed, do they get grandfathered and they get to keep them? But if brightness is the issue, well, but we would be adding brightness. So. Brightness is another issue to talk. So I would say it was never temporary, so not. Yeah, like, yeah. It's never a temporary sign. Never temporary sign. There's no way that, for our current definition, you say that's a temporary sign. That they never came to the ARB for um, to for anything for those those signs because they say they're temporary. They never came up. Yeah, but I, but I don't think you can read that temporary sign definition to think that that's the temporary sign. Well, you so know, no well, we, did, we didn't that. have a definition of temporary sign. Before. Uh, All of this goes but, away, but, so we can't have grandfather. Remember, because we were getting design. nowhere, we were getting nowhere, yeah. and so we decided to eliminate the temporary signs, and then, but never intending that it be this, you know, um, exception that swallowed up the whole. Which it seems <laughs> to have, you know. So good point. All right. So we're just fixing that up, but I don't think just in, in um, common sense. Because if, if something isn't defined, you just have to use a common sense or dictionary definition of it. And I don't see how you could possibly. If you have someone install electricity and carpenter visit it, I don't see how you could convince me to argue this. Well, only because the content changes. The content changes. That's why. The structure yeah. isn't temporary, but the content is because I can go up to, while you're talking to me complaining, I can go out and take out the photograph and put a new one in. My 30 day clock starts again, or 60 days. Yeah. Same with the blackboard. I can go erase six words and put something else up on it. Reset the clock. So, is there a way that that doesn't get grandfathered? Well, that's, that's because. Oh, temporary sign? Thomas asked if it was never temporary sign. Yeah. And that will have to be addressed. And also to Connie's point about brightness. Well, that's something that we need to be more about. Yeah, yeah. 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 I keep running down like a little bit because <laughs> of the size. <laughs> because that's what you get. I can watch you. <laughs> right, this is going to be a difficult one because yeah, we have to decide at, at, because, and I just want to tell you why, is because the complaints I've heard have not just been nighttime brightness, but it's been scintillation brightness during the daytime was a complaint about color yeah. signs that was at eye level, and if you look down the street, it was still bright. You know, maybe it was late afternoon, but it was so bright that it hurts people's eyes. I know. It's going to be hard. I mean, I don't know no. how you do it. You'll do it in, you know, white candles or lumens, and then you're going to say, how do we measure lumens or white candles? You know? Yeah, you got to get yourself yeah. a noise ordinance. Yeah. That's right. You guys have to get at a uh, reader. Yeah. 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 The different scale. Yeah. 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 Huh? That's why I'm, I'm hoping yeah. that some code yeah. would have some more like qualitative yeah. language. Yeah. No, they still do. Qualitative language. If the I think they do. People who walk by it frequently so find it disturbing. Why do you think lumens can still be <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't have any problem with it. All right. So other than the sign code. Another thing to sign. Are we allowed to sign that um, Is this project out? Like um, the grill and maybe um, Nima. Yes, that, that yeah, was that, written in all years ago. The comp was changed already. Yeah, specifically for that. Those are really heavy extra. Have a night. Have a new year. Motion to adjourn. Have a second. Second. All in favor. Bye.